redeeming the time because the days are evil. Buy up every opportunity with time, every second of your life. I was born in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, my parents were farmers. Uh, there were five of us boys and one sister when all of us children actually were born and lived. Uh, we were poor people because there was a drought in northern Texas where my family was in the farming business. If it hadn't been for my uh, dad taking extra jobs, we wouldn't have had sufficient food, but we had plenty of food. And we really didn't know that we were that poor we moved to Colorado whenever I was seven. Dad started over again in farming, and he had really lost the shirt off of his back in Texas, and he took up farming there, and things went some better, and we didn't have as much poverty uh, from then on. I had the privilege of being born and raised in a beautiful mountain valley in western Colorado, near Delta, we had the largest flat top mountain in the world to our north and at our south out of our kitchen window we could see the San Juan Mountains. It was an old fashioned farm. My dad would raise hay and barley and corn and feed it through cows and pigs so we had chores every day to do. My job was to gather eggs, wash them, candle them and get them ready to sell on the roadside, my mom had a sign, fresh eggs, and people would stop to get eggs and milk. I came to know the Lord about a year after we moved to Colorado. My dad had to take an extra job, and he was picking up dairy milk in 10-gallon cans for a man that needed some help on the weekend. That man was a Christian, and he invited us to go to church. And the first Sunday I remember God spoke to me about my need of Christ. That bald-headed preacher was preaching that we all deserved hell. That bald-headed preacher proclaimed out of the Word of God that if we get what we deserve, we're going to go to hell. And for the first time, that became a reality to me. But he also preached the cross, and I'll never forget the image that he portrayed of Christ. Him dying on that cruel cross, and it struck me that he did that for me. I was too proud to go forward the first uh, time that I was convicted in a Sunday morning service. My mom, being a normal mom, sensed that I was distressed. She didn't know how to lead me to the Lord, but she said, Tony, just do what the Lord is telling you to do. And finally, it came to a point, I said, God, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I just want to be saved. I finally said, my pride's not the issue. Salvation is the issue, and I got Christ that day. Because we were constantly in church, I made a profession of faith when I was young. But as often happens with young salvation decisions, I came to wonder, did I really come to know the Lord? And so I struggled with the assurance of my salvation even into adulthood until the Lord brought me to a verse in Romans 8, 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. And today I'm as sure as I can be that I know the Lord and I praise Him for saving me. Right after I got saved, my dad heard that there was a problem in the church I don't know how he verified that or if it was actually true, but he heard there was a power struggle going on. As a result, I didn't grow in the Lord because Dad dropped out of church and we didn't get into another church. So for 11 years, I had no growth in Christ. But after I got to my senior year, God began to deal with me circumstantially. And I signed contract to play college football on a scholarship and God took it away through an injury and I couldn't go play college ball, so I started on a search for happiness, and I tried thing after thing, another school, a girlfriend, work. Finally, I was trying the last option to make me happy. 
I was going to become a hermit. I was going to homestead in a remote area in North America and get away from people because they were the thing I thought was causing me to be unhappy. I was still unhappy. And God began to deal with me as I picked up a Bible that I had in my possession and I began to read it in Genesis. And God began to really show me that I was unhappy because I was not living for the greatest person in the universe, and that's God. And I had an accident out in that remote area and almost cut off my right arm with a power chainsaw. But within a minute or two after, I realized I'd cut my arm and I could have bled to death out there in that wooded area. I said, God, I'm going to go back to my hometown and you show me what you want me to do. From this day on, I'm going to do whatever pleases you. That was the turning point in my life. And after I got home, a pastor that had visited my home 11 times and I had never met him, came back to my home with an evangelist and they were in revival meetings. And that's all I needed to have was a personal invitation from that pastor and evangelist. And within a four or five months, I was going out on visitation with my pastor and one night out on visitation, I made a comment of, to a lady the importance of being in church. And I made a statement, you know, no telling if my parents had been going to church, I might be studying for the ministry someplace. And God turned that statement on me that night and said, well, nothing's keeping you from studying for the ministry now, Tony. The pastor afterwards sensed God dealing with me and he just asked if God was dealing with me about the call of the ministry. And I said, I'm not sure he may be. And that night he asked me to volunteer and say, God, I'm willing if you want me to go. And when I did that, then God began to work step after step, showing me that he wanted me in the ministry. And within about six months of that time, I was studying for the ministry at Bob Jones University. I met my husband when I was 15 years old. My family went to a fundamental church in Delta, Colorado, and he ended up at one of our morning services one morning. And I first noticed him as my dad would stand at the back of the church after the morning service and greet people. And my dad was talking to him asking him all kind of questions. They had a lengthy conversation. I was not in on any of it, but I do remember clearly on our way home from church that morning, just badgering my dad with question after question about the handsome young athletic man that had come to our church. I know beauty when I see it. And that night I saw beauty and I said, I would like to get to know that young lady. But you know, God had his own timing, and after she graduated, she came to Bob Jones. And about three months after she came to Bob Jones, we started dating, and it was the right time. I'm so glad that God led me to that church. He worked in my heart spiritually in so many ways, but he worked in my heart toward getting the right wife for me in that church building. My first pastoral ministry was right after I graduated from graduate school. We spent about four and a half years of ministry at Welcome Baptist Church in Central South Carolina. It was just a lovely experience, a wonderful experience for a young man. I didn't really know a lot of what I was doing. I had some knowledge. But uh, we saw a lot of people come to Christ. I had the privilege of being a young man. 26 and 28, at the times I started as interim and then as a part-time pastor, and the Lord to use that ministry to further His cause. In approximately 1981, my husband and I had just come from a pastorate. I had grown up in a small church and wanted again to be able to have a small church setting. Morningside was in the old building on East North Street by, by the Bilo Shopping Center there.
Morningside was running about, uh, I think, 175, 200 people at that time. And we attended there, and sure enough, it was our size. It seemed to be a fit for us. And so in 1981, we joined Morningside Baptist Church. Now, there were some people there that are still in Morningside. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to recall all of them, but I know Gloria Burroughs was there, uh, her family. Uh, I know the Roger family was a part of Morningside at that time. Uh, David and Martha Brown during that time were a part. My wife uh, got involved in the music ministry. I did some counseling with people as the previous pastor would ask me to help. And at one time I was teaching the adult Sunday school class in our first building here on this site. Two, that's our, our study place. May of 2004. I would just like to... The deacons asked if I would consider it being interim pastor. All vanity. What is he doing here? I think Solomon is really a man here. He's saying, I've got some We'd way We've been I there for about a month and the deacons came and said, would you consider becoming our pastor? And uh, we at that time said, we'll pray about it. Let me just say, it has been a sifting time. Any time that you try to find God's will that's unwritten, that is that which doesn't say, it doesn't say any place in the Bible that Tony Miller should be the pastor of Morningside Baptist Church. That's the unwritten will of God. And our hearts have been sifted this summer, and I know your hearts have been sifted trying to seek God's will in the matter. But I also feel humbled. I come from a poor dirt farmer's home. I am a poor sinner, saved by His grace, and I don't deserve the privilege that I have to be your leader. I know that. What a privilege to serve 10 years here in this ministry. I suppose the future hope that I have for the ladies here could best be described by Paul's prayer in Philippians 1 and verses 9 through 11. In that passage, he brings out the fact that they would abound more and more. I have just been so totally blessed by the ladies here at Morningside and their love for the Lord. I don't think there are kinder, more godly women anywhere than I've met in this church. And, and my prayer is that that love that they have for the Lord and other people would just abound and grow and that the knowledge of the Lord, that they would gain a, a, a love and a practical knowledge of Him. And it, those verses go on to say, a discerning, a perception and insight. And Paul finishes his prayer for the people there that they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness. I would pray for our ladies that they would be fruitful, that they would fulfill God's purpose for them in words, in attitudes, in actions, that all the praise would go to God. Awake to spiritual life. Hey, get out of your sleep and get resurrected and shine the glory of God. Christ wants to shine upon you and He wants to shine through you. In the marketplace of life, God gives everybody time and opportunities with those times to make their life count for eternity. Morningside is doing well, but it can grow. We are light. We are the light of the world now. We're to show God's holiness. When I step away the last Sunday as official pastor here, my prayer will be that Morningside will become better, that it will not decrease in any way. Lord, we do pray that as we have only one life, we use every bit of time for eternity. John put it this way, I must decrease but he must increase. And if there's one thing that would be my prayer is that Morningside would increase in Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ would increase here.